this reading is from Race and Reunion, a book by David W. Blight, who's a professor at uh, Yale. And it's the story of the first Memorial Day in Charleston, South Carolina, May 1st, 1865. During the final year of the Civil War, the Confederate command in the city had converted the planter's race course into a prison. Union soldiers were kept in terrible conditions in the interior of the track. At least 257 died from exposure and disease and were hastily buried without coffins in unmarked graves behind the former judge's stand. After the fall of the city, Charleston's Blacks, many of whom had witnessed the suffering at the racetrack prison, insisted on a proper burial of the Union dead. The first Decoration Day, as this event came to be recognized in some circles in the North, involved an estimated 10,000 people, most of them Black former slaves. During April, 28 black men built a suitable enclosure for the burial ground at the race course. They constructed a fence 10 feet high, enclosing the burial ground and landscaped the graves into neat rows. The wooden fence was whitewashed and an archway built over the gate. On May 1st, 3,000 black children, newly enrolled in freedmen's schools, marched around the race course, each with an armload of roses and singing John Brown's body. The children were followed by 300 black women representing the Patriotic Organization, a group organized to distribute clothing and other goods among the freed people. The women carried baskets of roses, wreaths, and crosses to the burial ground. The Mutual Aid Society, a benevolent association of black men, marched into the cemetery followed by large crowds of black and white citizens. A scene recorded by a newspaper correspondent. When all had left, this is a quote from the newspaper, when all had left, the holy mounds, the tops, the sides, and the spaces between them were one mass of flowers, not a speck of earth could be seen. There were few eyes that were not dim with tears of joy. The children sang, America will rally round the flag and the star spangled banner. The war was over and Memorial Day had been founded by African Americans in a ritual remembrance and consecration. But the struggle to own the meaning of Memorial Day had only begun. Greg Coleridge is an Ohioan, born in Akron, and lives now in the Cleveland area. He graduated from Oberlin College in Oberlin, Ohio, with majors in urban studies, government, and sociology anthropology, followed by an urban studies internship at Boston University. He began working for the American Friends Service Committee of Northeast Ohio in 1983. After working on problems aligned with economic and social issues for several years, he describes his coming to realize that the fundamental governing rules of our country were structured against those governed. Over time, he has labored and continues to labor with others to honor how corporations acquired constitutional rights never intended by the founders and to work for authentic self-determination for Americans. Greg served an elected term on the National Governing Board of Common Cause. He is a principal with the Program on Corporations, Law, and Democracy. He is Outreach Director of Move to Amend, an organization promoting amendments to our Constitution, affirming corporations are not people and money isn't speech. During his career, he has written books, articles, and a film uh, documentary focused on these ideas, the maintenance and distribution of an online real democracy history calendar and a, a, an online monetary history calendar is ongoing. I recommend that you look at those. 
Greg has no correct, uh, direct connection with Portland, but he offers evidence of an affinity. With today's presentation, within a 12 month period, he will have made presentations in both Portland, Maine and Portland, Oregon. Strangely believe it. Like many of us, Greg enjoys everything outdoors, particularly hiking, walking, and swimming with his wife, daughter, and son-in-law. They visited, and I would guess that they hope to continue to visit, many national parks, particularly in the Western US. Today, Greg will speak to us on an essential and very difficult question. How the pandemic and economic crises impact the movement for real democracy. Well, greetings, everyone. Appreciate very much the opportunity to be with you this morning on this uh, solemn Memorial Day weekend. And all the more impressive that you are here when maybe if your weather there is anything like it is here, it's pretty nice. And uh, so certainly uh, I would be, if I wasn't here, certainly drawn to be outdoors. But uh, hopefully you will, will have an opportunity to take full advantage of uh, the rest of the weekend. Just wanted to thank before starting, uh, Stephen, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, Helen, uh, who I communicated with early on, Ingrid and Wayne, and wanted to acknowledge a colleague with Move to Amend, Darla Truitt, who is from the Portland area, who is waving. Hey, Darla, good to see you. Uh, she is a local who is connected to our Move to Amend affiliate in your part of the world. So uh, hopefully she will have an opportunity to share some of the mischief making that she and the Portlandites uh, are involved with in this whole sphere of work as I share with you a little bit about uh, what we do and our concerns uh, from a national perspective. So being the Luddite I am, this is where I cross my fingers, toes, and everything else as I try to connect now <clears throat> as I share my screen. All right, well, I've put together a few uh, slides to try to go over uh, addressing this topic of how the pandemic and economic crisis impact democracy, impact our work um, at Move to Amend, and uh, the larger movement for real democracy. And so I begin actually with the connection to Portland. As uh, mentioned in the introduction, I am uh, affiliated with an outfit called POCLAD, the Program on Corporations, Law, and Democracy. Uh, it's been a think tank for about 25 years or so of frustrated activists who um, are striving for real democracy and trying to unearth the um, reality of corporate rule and corporate power. And one of the principles of POCLAD, uh, my colleague, is a woman named Virginia Rasmussen, who spoke at a gathering almost to the day 20 years ago, again in your part of the world, at a conference called End Corporate Dominance. And I don't know if any of you are familiar uh, with that. Apparently, it was a series of conferences over a number of years, and I'm not sure. I think 2000 was near the last one of several of them. Anyway, she at that gathering 20 years ago, almost to the day, had these words that I thought were somewhat appropriate to begin. And they read, I like to introduce three needed realms of our work. If we are to celebrate true rather than the first is associated with how we take things in, how we listen, our habits of noticing, our care in reading, in comment and commenting. We can learn and we can teach only that for which our receptors are tuned. The second realm to which our roots and rigor must be brought to bear is in the kind of strategies we design into our campaigns against corporate power. These strategies need to reflect an understanding of the current rule of law that puts we the people subordinate to the property few organized in their corporate forms, and they must reflect our commitment to reversing that law. And finally, the third one relates to our vision of what is possible. For us to propose that people have the capacity for true inclusive democratic self-governance is to place ourselves within a worldview and set of assumptions wholly contradictory to the patriarchal worldview that brought us our present earthly and human predicament. Without the opportunity to effectively engage this conversation, 
people will flounder. Highly skeptical that anything is possible from us humans. So with that in mind, and I will make reference to those three realms later on, just as uh, here's kind of the outline of um, what I was going to sort of share or some may say at the end of this babble at you here uh, this morning. I'd like to just share with you briefly uh, what Move to Amend is, how the pandemic and economic crises have, have disproportionately benefited the rich and corporations, the powerful, how the pandemic and economic crises impact democracy and our work, and I suspect your work as framing the big to share briefly about the U.S. Constitution, corporate constitutional rights, or what we call corporate hijacking, and then how we can build real democracy during this pandemic, uh, plural, uh, as well. Then finally, an invitation, respectful, for all of you to join us taking collective action. Move to Amend is an outfit, a coalition begun on the day of the uh, Citizens United Supreme Court decision, famous or infamous decision it was in January 2010, of hundreds of organizations and hundreds of thousands of people committed to social and economic justice and in corporate rule and seeking to build a vibrant democracy. Genuinely, realistically, authentically accountable to the people, not corporate interests or the super duper do. Our principles and values, uh, we believe, uh, have some overlap with what uh, I know of humanists in general believe. A commitment to anti-oppression and solidarity organizing, coalition and movement building. We're seriously uh, tr always committed to trying to build from the grassroots up as opposed from the top down. An ongoing dedication to political education and a fiercely uh, spirit of being both politically and economically independent, which goes hand in hand. Because if you're not economically independent, then you surely are not politically independent. And oftentimes, <clears throat> the reverse is true as well. Our goals are threefold. To pass what I will shortly describe as our We the People Amendment to the Constitution to make clear that artificial entities do not have constitutions. And the other equally uh, bizarre current constitutional construct is so the goal of this amendment is to abolish this notion that political money in elections is equivalent to First Amendment free speech. Second, to build a multi-ethnic, intergenerational, and cross democracy movement that transcends uh, issues and oppressions. And thirdly, to provoke discussion organizing about how to make real the promise of democracy through constitutional renewal as ambitious, and certainly it is ambitious, to try to have a constitutional amendment that abolishes corporate person and money as speech, we see it as merely a stepping stone to much more fundamental review. Uh, re certainly uh, has always seemed incredibly far off, but you know what? I think given what we have seen over the past couple of months, uh, that vision is a, lit cl a little clear and a bit nearer to what needs to happen given the wholesale, I believe, and we believe, failure of our current system. So how does the pandemic and economic crisis, the health, the combined health and economic crises uh, that we are facing that are interrelated uh, disproportionately benefit uh, the rich in corporations? Well, there's sort of of them, I think, through our, the top three have to do with the three, if you will, tools that government has as at its disposal to either do justice or the opposite, injustice, right? Government has, at the, particularly the federal level, uh, the ability to spend fiscal policies, the ability to tax policies, and the ability to create and distribute money called monetary policies. So those are three tools right off the bat that uh, the government can either do good or not so good. And then, of course, there's the issue of regulatory creations or protections or lack of. There's covers or excuses that can be uh, done, uh, that can be used to, again, benefit disproportionately the rich in corporations. And of course, uh, at any time what goes on, look, fire over here to the left, that means we're not um, uh, looking at what's going on to the right, distractions. 
And so all of these top six are what uh, corporations in the well-to-do have used gloriously and extremely effectively to enrich uh, not only uh, profits, but also power uh, in their hands, uh, both uh, human and artificial. And that compares just the opposite. Basically everything, you know, it's sort of been a zero-sum game. So the rich and powerful uh, in corporations of gain have been oftentimes at the the rest of us, what the Occupy movement called the 99%. So here are very briefly are some of those um, disproportional benefits. Pharmaceutical corporations, when it comes to spending or fiscal policies, have been able to set ex exorbitant prices for vaccines and drugs that they will be developing with taxpayer, dollar, taxpayer dollars. That's already being locked in. And unless it's changed, uh, they will benefit tremendously. A vaccine corporation paid by the government four times, has been paid four times the price compared to a ventilator developed with taxpayer funds. Uh, funds that uh, have already been administered by the government earmarked for small business have gone to some corporations just to administer the uh, paycheck uh, or the, uh, the PPP program benefited for small businesses. The CARES Act uh, created this $500 billion, many people called slush fund, $46 billion set aside for and loan guarantees to airlines, cargo carriers, and large businesses, quote unquote, critical to national security, while the remaining over $450 billion went to uh, Treasury, uh, the Treasury Department and our friend Steve Manchin, who has uh, in effect, and I'll say something about this in a minute, turned over that money uh, to um, the Federal Reserve. And that funds the outright 454 billion can be used outright for purchases, as well as loans for stocks and bonds, banks and corporations, and will be leveraged as well. Large corporations have received ear funds earmarked for small businesses, uh, and that includes hotels, food services, even coal and oil gas corporations. And uh, recently you may have seen what was called the HEROES Act passed by the House a week ago Friday, expanded the eligibility to apply for these loans earmarked for small businesses to, yes, that's true, for corporate lobby organizations. That's not law yet, it's only passed the House, but that's, remember, this is a bill that sort of the House has passed. So these are the quote unquote liberals. I would think uh, our friends who control on the other side of the ideological perspective in the Senate will be more than to go along with that provision. When it comes to tax policies, the CARE Act included a, a very nice provision for uh, well-to-do real estate investors to use the depreciation on their properties to sort of shift those and have uh, depreciations uh, be appointed and sort of to take away um, and to reduce the taxes on any profits that those well-to-do people may uh, earn in the stock market. The vast majority of what is estimated to be over 10 years uh, of $135 billion will go largely to those individuals and households making over a million dollars. And it just is coincidental, of course, that uh, congressional members invest more money in the real estate sector than in anything else. So our friends in Congress, both Repubs and Democrats, will be personally benefiting from this sweet uh, little provision. Monetary policies, as previously mentioned, the $454 billion from the CARE Act transferred to the Federal Reserve uh, was handed over right away to the New York Federal Reserve Bank. Now I know monetary policy is a tough one to get your head around. Many of us can understand what tax policy is about and who wins and who loses. Same with spending policy, budget priorities that may be fair or unfair, sane or humane. But monetary policies are things that we just don't have much of a sort of a literacy about, but we need to get on the other side of that learning curve because monetary policies have, at least for the last century, been used to oppress, well, most of us actually, at the expense of very few namely banking corporations and well-to-do. And so it was and has been since the beginning of the uh, crisis uh, health-wise and economically-wise. The New York Fed is wholly owned by private banking corporations. They will be the ones administering 100% privately owned 
In fact, they right away, even though they were the administrative functions, to decide where that $454 billion would go to bail out uh, banking corporations and other uh, non-financial corporations, they themselves turned over the administration of that to BlackRock Corporation, which, so it is oddly enough, uh, they are also owners of bonds that potentially BlackRock Corporation will decide whether they, in fact, will be buying bonds owned by BlackRock Corporation, as well as many others. The Fed will be leveraging that $454 billion times into $4.54 trillion. They will be used not just to buy up, you know, decent, healthy um, uh, assets of companies, but what are called junk bonds, bad investments of large banks and corporations. Regulatory protections. You know, it's pretty nice that uh, the pandemic from the position of um, corporations that have uh, feel, that have felt that they have been oppressed by various uh, regulatory uh, protections can use the pandemic and use the economic uh, crisis to advocate for a reduction. And that is exactly what so far Congress and in particular the Trump administration is calling for. And heretofore, there have been the rollback of hundreds of protections against corporate abuses in the environmental realm. The New York Times, uh, either a week ago or two weeks ago, had a front page story of about 100 different, I think it was 98 exactly, environmental regulations that will be temporarily, and who knows how temporary that will be once uh, the crisis, quote unquote, uh, uh, somewhat uh, subsides. There's various healthcare. Uh, regulations, workplace rights and protections, uh, uh, protecting workers, uh, workplaces, uh, work environments, farms and foods, animal welfare, uh, safety and food have been rolled back, banking protections that, bank, uh, that protect depositors and small banks against big banks, well, basically everything. And you can think of uh, protection-wise, uh, regulatory-wise, has been on the table, if not already approved for rollback. Cover. By cover, we mean the many large corporations here that were experiencing various economic problems prior to the pandemic are using the pandemic as a shield or a cover to claim that now the economic problems that they are currently experiencing, which again, didn't originate with the pandemic, should nevertheless be grounds for receiving financial assistance. And that includes large coal, oil, fracking, and other fossil fuel related corporations, Boeing Corporation, and at least we're not sure, JP Morgan Chase, uh, too big to bank. And we know this because uh, as of last September, again, well before the pandemic ever uh, hit the US shores, the Fed was injecting beginning last September uh, 2019, more than nine, that's not a misprint, not billion, but nine trillion dollars into Wall Street in, what's something, in what is called repo loans. Those are short-term, make sure that uh, the banks are um, loaning to one another overnight. And all of that sort of froze up. And that was because all these other banks didn't want to loan to this one bank that uh, is felt is on the ropes and is ready to declare bankruptcy. And we're not quite sure which one, but we think it's probably J.P. Morgan Chase. So again, they're able, as well as many of the other too big to fail banks, to take advantage now of uh, some of the loans under this $4.54 trillion uh, the New York Fed, which is handed off to BlackRock, will be doling out. And finally, distractions. The pandemic has been uh, a terrific uh, distraction or excuse to double down on pro-corporate policies that uh, public, public pressures in the past prevented, like the Keystone Pipeline, call flash or privatized social security, the privatization or corporatization of the U.S. Postal Service, further corporatization of prisons, schools, uh, general reduction of transparency. For example, the New York Fed and Reserve in general now, which has never liked to sort of uh, disclose what they're doing as a result of uh, this uh, CARES Act 
now has got an exemption from having to disclose their meeting minutes and where supposedly these $4.4 trillion in loans are going to go, that's going to be exempt from the Freedom of Information Act uh, for the balance duration of the pandemic. And who knows, maybe beyond that. As well as a disruption from the increasing digital intrusion in our lives, the tracking of our movements on smartphones that uh, now we are being told we may have to do as a result of making sure that we're not coming into contact with anybody who may have the virus. We'll see where that goes. So all of that are instances that have benefited heretofore and counting it should be said because none of this has ended, it continues. So all of this compares to basically with the rest of us, the 99% of us, we jumps uh, basically relatively speaking in comparison uh, have uh, been uh, given and we've been told we should be extremely grateful for by comparison these, uh, what I would say, are crumbs. A one-time $1,200 check, extension of unemployment, eligibility and duration, a limited $600 per week extra unemployment pay payment uh, to make all uh, COVID-19 tests free, a help for our friends in our communities, your own small businesses. Again, these are important. They are helpful. Relatively speaking, however, relatively, not in absolute terms, well, actually both in absolute terms are insufficient and certainly relative to what the big banks and well-to-do have gotten are insufficient and less than. So we, again, again, just as in 2008, during the bailout of the Great Recession, Depression, financial implosion, whatever you want to call it, uh, the government bailed out. Meanwhile, the uh, main street, side streets, and back streets didn't get their fair share, if anything at all, what many people said were underwater. And so, why did this happen? Well, this guy, basically a, uh, a picture taken from Occupy Wall Street in DC. I think this guy's um, t-shirt sums it up so well. Our country, the country's broken because the system is fixed. Fixed as in rigged. And it has been for a very long time and certainly well before uh, the current uh, crises, both pandemic and economic. And it has to do with why Move to Amend has been around and has been working at trying to change some of the fundamentals, again, well before uh, the current crises uh, that we are experiencing. So how do these uh, crises impact democracy? Well, there's some negatives and there's some positives to it. Sort of the yin-yang phenomena, right? Negatively, the focus on immediate it needs right now, which is especially important and understandable for those who are being hurt and hammered the most, low-income people, people of color, the elderly, young people. These are people who are being forced to be on the front lines to exposing themselves because they don't have work, because they don't have enough support, uh, you know, health-wise, economic-wise. They're having to put themselves at risk doing uh, essential services, but also dangerous services, well, quite honestly, this means they have less time, energy, and resources to be involved in any social and political action, which means, relatively speaking, they are disempowered at this point in time. Budget cuts as a result of um, what we will likely see uh, once the bills come due for all of the spending at not only the federal level, but at the state level, you know, at least the federal level, uh, Federal Reserve can create money out of thin air. Uh, the government can issue uh, treasury bonds, bills, and notes and go into debt. Uh, but the states, you know, they're, they're up a crick. They're going to go into more debt. How are they going to balance uh, the budget? Basically, when you go into more debt at every level of debt, it means you're going to have to figure out how you're going to pay for it. And particularly at the state level and particularly at the municipal level, they're going to, I think, be more inclined to do what a lot of communities have done in the past, seeing economic problems. They're going to put their public assets up on the auction block, which is called privatization, if not corporatization. And for many communities, particularly own those that still own their public water systems or uh, energy systems, public power, those for corporations, those you would think the corporate crowd are salivating over 
because water systems and energy systems are those that can be exploited extraordinarily profitably by the corporate desperados. Deregulation means less public accountability. We the people have less ability, less power to sort of make accountable, right? When you deregulate, you have less ability to, to through regulatory agencies, make uh, corporate entities that are private entities publicly accountable. Because of our budget priorities, because of the tax priorities, monetary priorities, like this gap between rich and poor is growing. And what that means is when you have a growing gap, that means you have greater economic power in corporations. And historically, economic power translates into political power. And so that's certainly a negative. Their political power, zero sum game of rich uh, in corporations, mean we have those of us who don't have. Uh, you know, uh, an extremely uh, deep pocket uh, bank account and who don't own a corporation uh, have less political power uh, at our disposal. When you are uh, using it as an excuse, all of these instances, uh, as previously mentioned, what that does economically, it increases something called the moral hazard. And what that means is, you know, if you know, for example, that if you buy risky investments, and they're extremely profitable. If you win, you're going to you know, profit handsomely. But if you lose, so what? You'll be bailed out. And that's what's called a moral hazard. You don't have to be accountable. Uh, it's sort of socializing uh, or privatizing the gain and socializing the pain. And so with that sort of situation, again, you're going to increase the ability, the likelihood of benefiting if you uh, hit it positively and for the two big to rich corporations, you're going to have greater power. Again, greater economic power translates into political power. And the distractions that are previously mentioned means, again, further consolidation of power and profits. And it means, of course, particularly if the distractions serve uh, for the uh, corporations that are threatening our personal privacy, uh, or, you know, we're talking about potentially um, maybe having uh, greater corporatization or electronic voting by mail, so that puts at risk whether our elections, in fact, will be fair, and free, and available to everyone, particularly if some states are resisting that kind of situation. So these are some of the negatives associated with the current crises impacting democracy. By contrast, the positives. Well, there's an increasing, heightened, growing, a number of these things, anger over the disparity and justice, those who receive medical and economic help. Most people who are low, moderate income and the, the seniors and the like are getting more and more angry. They're beginning to strike, beginning to re, uh, resist. They're beginning to come together with others. And so that represents an opportunity to organize a greater understanding that the problems transcend one person one party, one law or state, one regulation, one decree. There's a greater recognition of the systematic problems that we're facing. It goes beyond the current uh, condition. A greater recognition or the comprehension that our crises that we're dealing with are connected. That certainly the health crisis sort of triggered an economic crisis and all of that is now triggering potentially a political crisis. How does this in fact impact our elections? And it, I think also, creates a greater social crisis and even greater potential division uh, between people across the political and ideological spectrums. There's a greater opportunity to build movements, movements and a greater awareness that we need systemic change, that we must act in scale in terms of problems and crises to address the lack of authentic democracy. And this last point I just want to lift up, that scale of problems needs to be proportionate to scale of solutions. Because oftentimes we hear we have a serious problem and what is being offered is by contrast minimal. And just to bring this out to four, maybe it's a kooky example, maybe not. But if the problem is basically this, that a sinking, uh, you know, a huge ocean liner is sinking, you don't solve it by using these tools, do you? No, you don't sort of spoonful or have a sponge or have a cup or try to get water out of the boat by a handful, 
but rather sometimes you need these tools, buckets, large buckets. If not, when the problem is massive, you need something that is massive in scale. The point is we must have problems and solutions be proportionate. And that is oftentimes not the case. Luther King once said, we must rapidly begin to shift from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society. When machines and computers, profit motives, and property rights are considered more important than people, the giant triplets of racism, materialism, and militarism are incapable of being conquered. And thus, we believe our the People Amendment, which H is in the Congress introduced as HJR 48, introduced by U.S. Representative Pramila Jayapal in the state of Washington, we believe is proportionately uh, consistent and appropriate to the increasing problems. It's not all that needs to be done. No means. I were saying this is merely the first step to a stepping stone, but it is a pretty darn important piece that is commensurate in scale to the increasing problems that we're, in, that we're facing because it addresses these three, basically two, made provisions and doctrines. The first saying that the rights protected by the Constitution are the rights of natural persons only. A real radical provision, right? That only should have inalienable constitutional rights. Artificial entities such as corporations, limited liability companies, and other entities shall have no rights under the Constitution and are subject to regulations by the people. That only people are people. And second, the federal, state, and local government shall regulate, limit, or prohibit contributions and expenditures. So here the notion is that money is a form of political free speech. Money is property. If you believe money is speech, then those who have the most money, well, it has the most speech. And that's a good definition of approaching anything, approaching a authentic democracy. And then the third point is nothing contained in this amendment shall be construed to abridge the freedom of the we believe the We the People Amendment is essential for so many, if not all of the economic and political issues, if not environmental concerns that we're facing uh, at the moment. Because corporations have hijacked our constitution and are working with the judiciary uh, to, use, uh, to be used against us. And that the solutions that are just and sustainable to the current uh, crises that we're facing, the pandemic and economic, as well as those major uh, formulative alternatives that we were pushing and many of us were pushing before these crises happened, like a Green New Deal, Medicare for All, uh, a which is a, a, a law introduced in uh, the Congress uh, beginning last year, calling for substantial democracy reform, uh, significant environmental policies, consumer protection, workplace protection, all required based addressing corporate constitutional rights. And that in addition, ultimately, to the pandemic and economic crises and the political crises we face of, uh, of money and politics is, we believe, at sort of a root, a constitutional and democracy crisis. And so we have to face it. And thus, dealing with the big picture of uh, what we are trying to address, we believe that uh, uh, move to amend and the We the People Amendment goes way beyond Citizens United and First Amendment free speech, uh, because the problems began well before 20, well before the Citizens United decision. The outside campaign donors have three times more access to chance. So the problem we're facing goes well beyond money is speech, well, be, well beyond Citizens United. Money in politics is certainly a big problem, but an undemocratic system is a bigger problem. There are all sorts of barriers to voting and political participation that are mentioned there, gerrymandering, all sorts of people being through voter suppression, people barred from being voter, uh, being uh, barred from voting if they're a felon. We have lack of representation at all levels of government. You know, who are people who we elect at a local, state, and federal level? They're mostly white males, young people under 30, uh, women, uh, people of color, Latinx, LGBTQ, Poor people are disproportionately underrepresented. Elite political influencers are virtually all white men. Framing the big picture, an undemocratic system rooted in injustice and inequality, enabling a culture of corruption. You know, we've had an undemocratic system that basically uh, starts, goes back to day one. Uh, our, the U.S. was founded 
upon a genocide, land theft, uh, theft and slavery within a legal foundation and framework. Corporate power built wealth upon extraction and exploitation of a vulnerable and marginalized community, communities beginning with Native American people. Think of the land that was stolen, the treaty rights and um, treaties about 350 or so that have been broken. And all of these unjust uh, situations around wages, unequal pay, redlining, gentrification, privatization, tax breaks, school to prison pipelines, uh, so many things. Women and people of color being, again, disproportionately impacted. It's important to acknowledge what the Constitution from the start and rights were, are, and were not. It was a question, uh, the Constitution, revolutionary in a sense, in a positive way, in a sense of giving we the people power to decide for ourselves and taking that power away from a sovereign king or queen whose authority to govern was vested from supposedly God. So we democratized that. That was a good thing. But we the people from the start was never all. We the people from the beginning was white male property owners. It excluded women, people of color, impoverished, white so basically, if you look at the original Constitution, it affirmed property rights over human rights. It was only those Bill of Rights that the rabble said, sorry, we're not going to uh, affirm, we're not going to pass, we're not going to justify, we're not going to, uh, you know, basically uh, create and ratify unless you put in a 10, first 10 amendments, which weren't there to begin with, that did exist in many states. State of Virginia, Massachusetts, state of uh, Pennsylvania had Bill of Rights. The original constitution of ours did not. And so people sort of forced uh, these Bill of Rights to be included. And what we have seen since is many of the rights that have been extended to people of color, to women and, and the like, came about people driving themselves into the constitution where originally they weren't to begin with. The US Constitution, we the people and corporations, some bad things, some good things. One of the very good things in the Constitution is that there was no mention of corporations. There were no rights given to corporate entities. They're not mentioned at all. They had no legal foundation. The revolution was in part a revolution, not just against the, um, the, the king or the king's military red coat, but against the king's crown corporate entities, like the Mass Bay Company, the Virginia Company, the Carolina Company. These were entities that were given uh, the power and the authority by the king to do the king's business. And so when the uh, uh, constitution was created and the country was revolted and we created a new country, we democratized, if you will, uh, those crown corporations and created things like the Massachusetts, uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So the, the state, the uh, Massachusetts Bay Company was, if you will, constitutionalized and democratized. Again, relative to the fact that only white male property owners were people. But still, we democratized that in corporations, therefore, which never had power, which never had rights, were created and were given license through we the people by given licenses or charters granted and or revoked one at a time by state legislatures. And so that was the intention. That was the norm. That was the default. Corporations had no rights. They only had privileges. So here's sort of an existence of what kinds of uh, the reality, the default of corporations prior to the first instance in 1886 of them gaining quote unquote rights. They didn't have their rights. They only had privileges. Um, when a corporation was created, it was uh, done through a charter. And when there were additional things granted to them. They were done through laws or statutes. And those statutes were, um, for example, a corporation was given the, the ability, the privilege to be treated as a single entity, uh, the ability to be able to enter into contracts, to own property, to sue and be sued. So these are privileges. These are, if you will, uh, protections. These are abilities. These are functions. They're not rights. You don't need corporate rights to do to own property, to sue and be sued and the like. These exist because of statutes. Corporation had a limited duration. 
Their purposes were defined by charters to benefit the public. Uh, again, they were approved or revoked by state legislatures, and they were prohibited altogether from participating in the political process. Here's one of my favorite instances of when a corporation uh, did not uh, follow its, when it violated the terms of its charter, uh, its charter was revoked. And here's some example, some language. We're here in my state, state of Ohio, back in 1900, when this dairy corporation uh, revoked, or I should say, went against the charter. It said the state of Ohio, in uh, in terms of the, um, um, what is it, the um, Supreme Court, said the time has not yet arrived when the created is greater than the creator. And it still remains the duty of the courts to perform their office in the enforcement of the laws, no matter how ingenious the pretext may be, power of the violators in the commercial world. So corporations escaped this democratic control over uh, basically over the right to be controlled and the ability to be controlled by we the people in three ways, by shifting decision-making from the state level to the federal level, by shifting decision-making to define corporate entities from the legislative to the regulatory arena, and by shifting decision-making to define corporate entities from the legislative to the judicial arena. And it's this third way where corporations first came granted constitutional rights. When the courts granted corporations constitutional rights by saying, voila, just like, if you will, you know, um, Frankenstein, creating this monster, uh, creating a corporate um, beast. And so if you will, what the Supreme Court did is they created this ability of corporations to be defined by sort of encapsulating them, by creating the shield and a moat around them, if you will, so that we, the people, couldn't get at them, couldn't get to them unless a bridge was draw, uh, drawn. So we couldn't get to them because now they were shielded by the Supreme Court. And not only was it a moat with water, but it was a moat filled with alligators. And so corporate constitutional rights, it should be said, was not originally intended. It's not inevitable. It's not like gravity or tides. It's not irreversible. It wasn't created by any law or regulation passed by any elected official or by any citizen. It, it was a conscious planned effort by corporate attorneys and activist judges. I'm going to just skip over. Uh, we can come back if you have some questions, but I just wanna show you briefly how corporations basically hijacked the, corporate, the, uh, the Supreme Court, I should say, they hijacked corporate amendments in corporate parts uh, or I should say democratic parts of the Constitution. So they hijacked various parts of uh, the Constitution and of, and of constitutional amendments, including political free speech. Political free speech was intended solely and exclusively for we the people. But through the courts, they granted political free speech rights to people, to money, but also to corporate entities. And as a result, huge amounts of money by corporate entities in elections. They also hijacked the First Amendment in terms of non-political free speech. So corporations acquired the right not to speak, including, and here's an example of what state of Vermont passed a law requiring bovine growth hormones, not even to sort of say you can't, um, you know, we're going to prevent bovine growth hormones from being put into dairy products, but it should be um, labeled. Uh, in a product, in milk products. So the dairy industry said, no, that's a violation of my right not to speak, and the courts granted that. Corporations granted Fourth Amendment search and seizure rights. Let me just go back here. This First Amendment free speech rights, we see still expressed today with Exxon Corporation claiming that they shouldn't have to over their pre-knowledge of all the years worth of knowledge that of fossil fuels uh, was going to be injurious to the climate. Same with Monsanto Corporation, claiming that the use of glyphosate, glyphosate was a uh, cancer, and we shouldn't have to turn over uh, our pre-knowledge of that. And both uh, corporations claiming that it's their First Amendment right not to speak. Fourth Amendment, search and seizure rights. Uh, you know, this was, again, meant uh, 
to apply just for individuals, but corporations have used it to prevent the disclosure of information and the, pre the, present the prevention of inspectors to come in to examine books. And imagine if Enron Corporation, if we the people had the ability to go in and look at their books. Or how about Wells Fargo? Remember all the bogus um, accounts that were created, hundreds of thousands had the right to go in and inspect their books. Maybe there wouldn't have been so many uh, accounts and so many millions of people that lost tens of millions of dollars. Fourth Amendment rights, of course, uh, has used and been misused uh, to, you know, you see the government sort of trampling on our rights. So that doesn't seem to be a, an issue for the government, but certainly they have been over Fourth Amendment search and seizure rights to corporations. Fifth Amendment takings rights. Takings rights is basically the, the, the right that says if we are the government, uh, you can only take a person's uh, property if you apply just compensation and, um, uh, and if that property is used for fair market value. Uh, and if that property is used for some sort of public purpose. Well, here, corporations claimed that even though you had um, property, homes, that were basically the land uh, underneath where people's homes were imploding uh, because of coal companies drilling and mining coal underneath. They, uh, the co companies were saying that we should have the right, if you're going to pass a law preventing that from taking place, you can't do that unless you give fair market value to the loss of income associated with the prevention of coal mining. And why that's appropriate is that today, there are people out there claiming that we need to keep oil and gas in the ground, coal in the ground, to, pre to sort of protect what's left of our natural world. And that the only way to do that is to make sure that we don't mine any of that. Well, of course, what the coal companies, what the oil and gas corporations could do is say, fine, you wanna do that, but you're going to have to compensate us for the loss of fair market value that could amount to the basically tens of trillions of dollars in lost revenue. 14th Amendment, equal protection due process, basically means that, that if you treat one corporation differently than another corporation, that that is sort of a violation of my discriminatory right, you know, the right against discrimination. 14th Amendment was passed to make sure that free black slaves were not discriminated against. But this was something that was by corporation very successfully throughout uh, history. So much that uh, there are many examples of where, I just wanted to give this one, where basically here is one where, um, no, let's go back, where Lewis versus, uh, Lewis versus Liggett, in which the people of Florida passed a law that uh, the audacity uh, those people did to pass a law in which a chain store was imposed with higher taxes than a locally owned series of stores. And the chain store went to court and said, you can't do that because you are violating my Fourth Amendment, 14th Amendment rights in that you are discriminating against us, a chain store over locally, uh, locally owned business. And the court went along with it. Many instances like that. I'll skip over the corporate hijacking or abuse of the Commerce Clause and Contracts Clause and just basically say how to build a real democracy during the current crisis. Now, this is the last section here. And I think how we do that is to go back to what uh, Virginia Rasmussen said. We need to do three things. First is how we take things in. Secondly, to be mindful of the strategies we design in our campaigns against corporate power. And thirdly, by understanding of what the vision is and that by making a vision possible. And so each of those, how to build real democracy uh, involves first how we take things in. And I think it's extremely important today um, in the midst of this crisis when people are so uncertain with what's going on, so unclear, there's no template. There's nothing that we can sort of hook our uh, sales onto, if you will, mixing a metaphor in understanding, you know, how does this compare to anything that's gone on? So I think it's extremely important as we're trying to connect with people and, and help people along 
and bring people to where we are and ourselves to try to maintain some resiliency and some strength to actively listen to both ourselves but to other people. And to do that, it's not just listening, but to authentically hearing what people are saying, to hear the concerns, the feelings, not just their ideas, not just their sort of thought, but their feelings. And to try to have legitimate conversations with people, not just to lecture, and to become comfortable. You know, as we try to listen to others, that means maybe listening to people who we don't always agree with, to go outside our comfort zone. And to do that, I think we have to, in essence, become comfortable at, be, at being uncomfortable, which is not an easy thing to do. And to be open to the means and not just the ends. By that, to sort of focus on trying to, you know, do things the right way, not be so ends oriented. The ends will take care of themselves. Or as Gandhi said, the, the means are the ends in the making. That we need to focus on, on, on how we do things and doing them the right way. And that by doing that, by actively listening, we'll start doing things the right way by responding authentically to where people are at and where that takes us, who knows? But where that takes us will only be authentic if we take the time to process what people have said, what we're hearing from that, as well as what we're hearing from ourselves. Because it's so easy right now, I think, during this pandemic to just sort of run off like, like our chicken, you know, like a head, or chickens with our heads cut off. So that's the first step, first strategy, or first round. The second is to design in our campaigns against corporate power. And for that, I think the strategies that we're going and we're focusing on is the We the People Amendment. And uh, for that, we are calling for and believe it's important to have both an inside strategy and an outside strategy. The inside strategy in building real democracy through the strategy to uh, resist corporate power is to promote the We the People Amendment, uh, to get it further in the House of Representatives. Three of your representatives in Oregon are co-sponsors, three of the 73 uh, in the country. We don't have any Senate co-sponsors yet, but yours might be. Uh, an outside strategy involves trying to get uh, resolutions or initiatives passed, trying to get what's called pledge to amend. We have a campaign in which we try to get candidates running for office at the local or the state level to say, if elected, we will do what we can to support the We the People Amendment, to get organizations to endorse. And there's 500 organizations around the country uh, over the past 10 years that have endorsed. To connect issues and groups by focusing on key constituents, we're working sort of strategically with labor organizations, with ethical and interfaith organizations, with young people and youth organizations, and to increase our organizational capacity to try to build affiliates, to have more advocates, to more have more members, to build out, we have what are called caucuses, and of course, to try to get more funding. And finally, uh, how to be democracy is to vision that is authentic. You know, if we don't change direction, as Lao Tzu said, we are likely to end up where we are headed. And the direction we are headed in is not a pretty one right now. Or as Sally Kempton, one of my favorite uh, sayings of all is that it's hard to fight an enemy who has outposts in your head. And the outposts in our head, I would say right now, is sort of a conditioned belief that, you know, we're too stupid or ignorant or powerless to do anything, to be effective of challenging the powers to be, that they're the expert, leave it to them. We should just be on the sidelines or, and either cheer or boo, but that's it. Not to be on the field, not to be in the game, not to take charge over our lives, our communities, over our world and over our natural conditions. And that's, you know, I think uh, in 1982, as Naomi Klein said, Milton Friedman wrote the highly influential passage that best summarizes what he called the shock only a crisis, actual or perceived, produces real change. When the crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. That, I believe, basic function, to develop alternatives to existing policies, to keep them alive and available until the politically impossible becomes the politically inevitable. If you've not yet read Shock Doctrine, I'd highly encourage it. So our belief in creating a vision to build real democracy we believe is certainly the We the People Amendment, but it's even more than that. To rethink alone and in solidarity with others, 
we think governance, economics, social relations, and our human earth relationships to try to look at the harmony and rethink the harmony between the macro and the micro, to look at and between meeting immediate needs and systemic change. And finally, trying to develop sort of a harmony between the personal and the political. You know, right now we sort of silo-wise, let's work at the macro level, or let's work at just system change, or let's work at just political level. And we ignore the micro level or meeting immediate needs or trying to address personal needs. We need to sort of do all of that together. And so I invite you to take action. These are many different ways to support a move to amend. We can come back to that if you're interested. Uh, text amend if you have a cell phone right now, a smartphone. I would invite you right now to just text the word amend to 38470, or you could go to our website, move to amend.org forward slash motion. I can come back to this um, page if you're interested. And just the last thing I will say is we have what's called an interfaith caucus one of our three caucuses within Move to Amend. It's made up of people of all faiths and no faiths that seeks to sort of try to look through the lens of issues of corporate rule and money and elections uh, from this uh, faith and ethical persuasion lens. Uh, we have an organizational team made up of you, yours, a Catholic, a Hindu, a secular humanist, a Presbyterian. We're looking to add to that. The values that we're focusing on is uh, to look to care for the poor, and to have stewardship of, of the earth. Nature never gives up, neither should we. That is something I think is um, hopeful and is something we need to think about. So sorry to go so long. Thank you so much. And uh, right now, open for cussing and discussing anything you might be interested in. I have a question. When we the uh, move and uh, the we the people amendment, uh, how do we expect the rich and powerful to react to try to maintain their uh, power other than buy up all the newspapers? Well, there's several ways they do it. You know, one is of course they at least retain public officials depending on how you want to look at it. They use their, you know, economic power to translate it into political. So they spend money and donate or invest in the political system. They lobby. Um, they certainly buy the media and influence the media. They create front groups, you know, what are called as opposed to grassroots efforts. They will uh, create astroturf efforts that uh, give the appearance that here's what we really want. Uh, here's what really the people are behind, but it can only be partial. And there's certainly, an, and have been from time immemorial, you know, uh, the powers to be have used Things like divided uh, and or co-optation to uh, be effective at uh, getting what they want and or to maintain the status quo. If need be, they will just simply oppress. Uh, they will, you know, simply try to, uh, you know, use the power of the state that, to, to what extent, whatever portions of the power of the state they have to try to use it to, you know, to threaten, to imprison, to arrest and the like. So there's all sorts of ways. Uh, Sometimes when it looks like that the history is against them, that, um, you know, that the, the um, arc of history, uh, you know, bends toward justice, as Martin Luther King says, uh, they will then, you know, try to accommodate and create uh, some change and give up some things, hoping that some reforms will sort of be enough to take the energy away. And so we're seeing that now around efforts to get big money out of politics and in corporate constitutional rights. There are some, some, there are some efforts out there that are very uh, tangential and very weak that would say, well, let's try to you know, make money in politics more transparent, or let's sort of try to limit the amount of money in elections, not you know, just sort of barely limit, just a little bit. It won't fundamentally change uh, how we do it, but again, it will give the appearance and give people who are working on this sort of a sense of accomplishment, placate people, but by doing so, take enough of the wind out of the movement that anything powerful that is more potent won't be successful. Uh, we have a question from Bernd. Yes, hi, Greg. Uh, I appreciate your presentation, everything you're doing, and I, especially your thinking resonates with me. And I, I heard you referencing 
you peripherally touched on how life moves more online with COVID and how that ex exposes us to greater risk of exploitation of data privacy. And that reminded me to uh, Shoshana Zuboff's recent work on what she calls surveillance capitalism. And uh, I bring this up. Um, I work in artificial intelligence specifically the human rights aspect of it. And I think it plays into it. And what I haven't heard you mention, I would love to see if you have a perspective on it or maybe we can collaborate on that. Uh, there is a movement actually to give robots and artificial intelligence human rights or equal rights as humans in order for them to be more effective and represent their human stakeholders, which happen to be rich corporations, rich people. So I see a same dynamic playing out that we had early 1900s corporations becoming personhood playing out the same way with artificial intelligence. Now, we're not quite there yet, but there is an ambition to do just that. So I feel like while we're fixing the corporate power, the next hole in the boat is already opening up, which will be giving robots this power as a surrogate to people. And this will manifest in ways, if I'm a rich person, what keeps me from having building a thousand robots, I'll have the right, right to vote. So we'll dilute the actual power of the real people. And uh, if, if, if you don't have perspective on it now, I'd love to catch up with you and then discuss this further because I see this as a very related risk that should be kind of considered in the same same movement and, and spirit. Well, yes, I, uh, you know, hey, I rambled on too long as it was, but yes, you're absolutely right. That is certainly a concern. Uh, corporations being given uh, quote unquote personhood. I believe uh, Saudi Arabia has already done it. I think the European right. Union uh, has already done it or has spoken about doing it and there's yeah. been some, there's been some pushback in which scientists and engineers have come out and issued i think an open letter to the european union or some part of europe saying no this is dangerous both from a political standpoint but also from an economic standpoint from a liability standpoint because if you give individual robots not just robots but remember artificial intelligence is not just sort of a robot person but it's also for example say a self-driving automobile so if self-driving automobile gets into an accident and kills someone, but that self-driving automobile is a individual person and is no longer connected to Google or whoever built the self-driving automobile, if they're no longer on the hook, then again, you have this thing called moral hazard and the most you can sort of, you know, there's no deterrence, therefore, relatively speaking, deterrent effect to make that automobile safe because the only liability then will be sort of the value of that individual automobile or whatever that individual automobile may be insured for, which won't be much. So, you know, what you get for it? Well, how much is the metal scrap heap? A car, as opposed to being able to get together and have a class action suit against Google Corporation or against Ford Corporation or Elon Musk, you know, uh, Tesla Corporation. There will be far less so it is both from a political and an economic. I do touch on this in my Real Democracy History Calendar, sort of a shameless self-promotion. If you're interested in being a part of that and get that, it's free. Uh, hit me up, uh, send me an email at greg at moochamen.org. And I'll show you how you can sign up. I, I, uh, I have a question about the juxtaposition of, of, of people and the economy that is constantly being put forward to us as the real issue that needs to be solved in order to get past this pandemic. Um, it seems to me that in fact, the constant uh, uh, giving of money, uh, creation of money uh, that is, has gone on and I think will go on uh, for quite some time because this endemic, the, the uh, pandemic is not going to go away soon is ultimately going to work against those who are protected because they have money. That is, there's a huge amount of money that's being uh, pumped into somewhere um, that needs, that will dilute the value of uh, real property. And I'm curious to know um, what you see in the near term as the struggle uh, to sustain an economy in the midst of, an, of a pandemic uh, uh, goes on. Well, I think you're quite, uh, quite spot on, Stephen, in terms of concern related to the well, you know, printing of uh, money. Um, you know, in the, in the short, 
Um, when you have a crisis, as has happened in the past, there is an appropriate role for the government to be involved in whatever ways to take leadership, whether that's symbolic and just trying to provide some assurance, you know, the personal leader that's saying, okay, we'll make it our way through. The only thing to fear is fear itself, that sort of thing, to give that kind of solid support and leadership, if not political will, and saying, yeah, we're gonna, we're all in this together and let's figure out ways to do it, but also economically and to provide some support in some uh, instances of, uh, you know, tangible support. And that may mean to go into debt. Uh, but that needs to, I believe, and many people believe, be earmarked to meet those who have the greatest need, as well as economically, if it's the economy as a whole, you know, to make sure that you are, have, you know, you have one eye on the, on helping people make sure they aren't hungry, they aren't homeless, they are getting health care, but also one eye on what is it going to take to sort of get this thing we call the economy going. And what many countries are doing today, what many countries in the past have done is you put more money into the hands of people who are going to buy. You know, you can create either demand or supply. If you put money into the hands of sort of the corporate entities, you're hoping that they'll increase supply that people will buy. But if you put money into the hands of people, then all of a sudden you're creating potentially demand. Because wow, you got now all this money and hopefully people are gonna meet their needs but there'll be some left over and that some of that money then will go into the economy at large and that's how you prime the pump. Now in terms of whether there's too much money being printed at some point, absolutely. If money is being created and it's only being used for speculative investments and it's only being used to prop up the stock market, to buy back stocks as what has happened so often in the past and what is being talked about is happening again, then what that is going to result in is a widening gap between rich and poor because again, disproportionately, who owns the stocks in this country? It's not, you know, we may, if we have any kind of 401k, maybe a little bit that helps, but it's disproportionately the very rich. And so again, that's going to disproportionately increase the well-to-do. And again, they're going to take their increasing economic power and, to, and do it and, and translate it to make sure that their interests are protected. Okay. One other thing, and that is I want to give a Darla, who is with uh, uh, the Portland uh, affiliate, an opportunity to just say anything, if she could just for a minute, is that okay? Hold people over for a minute? Yeah. Great. Uh, thank you for having me, and I thought Greg made a great speech there. Um, so we do have a very small chapter in the Portland, Oregon. Um, the things that we've worked on over the past year is uh, lobbying Senator Wyden and uh, Merkley. Um, Merkley at one point was going to introduce our bill in the Senate, um, but has since backed out. And uh, we are trying to get him to work on being a co-sponsor and he has not committed to that either. So um, that's one of our struggles right now. Um, we've had some rallying events and we do a lot of signature gathering at um, street fairs, which of course now with the virus makes a bit of a challenge this year, but we are working to try and uh, you know, make this happen. Uh, that's kind of all I have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Darla. Thank you. Well, I want to um, uh, thank you so much, Greg, for your presentation. And you've given certainly given us a lot to think about. And uh, uh, your cause is uh, well worth all the labor that you're you're putting into it. Thank you so much. Thank you.